and welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Robbie. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, I can't believe I haven't had you on before. I'm, I'm so excited to have you and uh, have a million questions for you. Oh, we'll have fun. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to start um, by talking about your book, Subscription Marketing. It's now in its, I think, third edition. Yep. Um, why have you updated it twice since its initial publishing in 2015? Yeah, so there's two reasons for that. Um, first is, and I think you probably agree with me that the market has changed and matured since 2015. Um, so in 2015, when it first came out, I had to spend a lot of time, or I did spend a lot of time in the book explaining to people why the subscription model was relevant to them, even if they didn't realize that it was, or why, you know, I, I honestly had people selling software through the cloud saying, oh, is this for newspapers and magazines, Anne? I didn't know that was your market. It's like, <laughs> this is you, this is for you. <laughs> um, so so first was that the understanding of the market has changed. Um, and as things kept changing, I wanted to update. You know, you could make an argument that we can talk about later that there should be a fourth edition post-pandemic on the lessons from that, right? Because things have yeah. certainly changed there. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to write it, but there could be, there could be one. Um, okay. So the fir the first time you updated it was 2017, okay. 2017. Um, and it, I, I updated it in part because things had updated, but also because I, my own understanding had changed and the new of the nuances of the market. Uh, here's a, a, a tip to anyone here who's thinking of writing a book. If you do it kind of the backwards way, like I did, which is you write this research and write a book, and then you go out and talk to people about it. Um, you're going to deepen your expertise a lot, not only in writing the book, but in afterwards talking to people about it. And one of the things I found, um, which was so interesting to me, was that I was writing for the wrong audience. I th I realized, I learned that it's really hard, well on nigh impossible to change some fundamental behavior in the marketing organizations in established businesses, right? It's just... I ran into such headwinds there with the people I thought were my core readers who would say things like, and this is great, but I love these ideas, but you know, I'm incentivized on net new leads. So I'm never going to do this. Or, you know, uh, I come from a background where the people who did marketing for your current customers, that was a, that was a backwater. You didn't want to be put there. It was a career killer to be put in that part of the organization. I'm like, wow, what is wrong with marketing that we treat our own customers as toxic, right? What's what's wrong with this? Um, so, but I did hear from entrepreneurs. I did hear from startups. Uh, I did hear from the growing subscription box industry. And I heard from those larger companies that had been my clients back in the day, but I heard from the people in the customer success teams because they were the ones who were picking up the relationship after marketing had dropped it. And sometimes they were even running a whole like shadow marketing organization in their, you know, outside with their own CRMs, just like siloed. I don't think, I hope that's not happening so much anymore. But so I learned some nuances of how things were working that I just didn't have the insight into when I first wrote the book. So the second edition was much longer. The third included more split outs for how do you do this if you're a solopreneur? What are the things to take from that? What are the things to take if you're a rapid growth startup? You know, I, I added some other things I would also learned about the different audiences for the book. Yeah, it's so interesting. I had I had very similar experiences. And, you know, our, our first books came out around the same time, 2015. Yeah. And for me, I wrote the membership economy as a one pound business card to say, this is what I see. This is what I believe. If it makes sense to you, let's work together, I can consult to you. Um, if you're saying the things and that people were, that you were just describing that people say to you, I'm probably, don't, let's not even waste our time. Because if you tell me that the person I should be dealing with is all the way in the backwater of the marketing department, very junior, very little power, yeah, we're not gonna, we're not gonna make any change happen. Yeah. Um, and, and it's change. I mean, I think you're right. You know, it's funny because like book two, you definitely needed to be talking more to the startups, more to the de novo subscription mm -hmm. businesses. Um, but today, I, I mean, I don't know what you think, but I, I'm seeing a lot of big companies being told from the top, we need to get into subscriptions. And suddenly 
there's an appetite for, you know, how does this affect the whole organization? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you were always speaking at that much higher level. So I think you've maybe been, you know, speaking at the right level to make this message across. And I was coming in too low, I think. But it is encouraging to see. I mean, I see it, it's still not as it's still not as widespread as I would have thought it was going to be. Right. I mean, I still see a lot of the old mindset and we can talk about, you know, that and how that underscores or undermines our vision and our strategies for subscriptions and, and membership and ongoing relationships. But yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, a question I have for you and something I've been grappling with recently is, you know, in a subscription business, where does the role of marketing stop? Is it, you know, I'm responsible for identifying target audience and reaching out to them, but once they sign up, it's not my problem anymore, or does their role continue post-sale? You know, I think that the roles should continue, but obviously I think that our our silos, our barriers have to be really permeable in the organization. And that's the real trick to it, is building in that sort of cross-organization permeability. I mean, yes, there can be a handoff to customer success, but it ought to be seamless and planned and orchestrated. And part of what what the subscriber perceives as a consistent relationship from the prescriber's perspective you know they have a relationship with one organization not five departments or that that's what it should be that's what that's it, should it should be. feel it should yes. feel like one journey yes exactly exactly so yeah and it's interesting because you're i mean you're a writer's writer right you've in addition to your book on subscription marketing you've written a lot of books on the writer's process and yep. You know, you have a new book coming out about um, about voice, uh, yeah. writerly voice. Um, it, one of the things that I think about is, you know, in a, in a B2B subscription business, in a, in a SaaS or any kind of as a service business, you know, do you need marketing and customer success, which is, you know, customer success being the post sale relationship organization? Is that a marketer or is that just a good communicator? Um, you know, the roles, yeah. I think, are changing. The roles are changing. And I think, you know, fundamentally, there are there are things in the marketer's toolkit, let's say, that are really, really helpful in customer success. They're really helpful in, in sales. You know, there are things, there are marketing strategies and tactics. Um, I, marketing is how you do some of these relationships at scale, right? That, that should be how it happens. Um, so communication is obviously a, an overarching skill, um, and one that's really critical to maintaining successful relationships with your customers. Uh, so it's certainly something that can't belong exclusively to the marketing organization, but um, in terms of creating that fundamental relationship story and the story that you have of how you engage with your customers, that's something that might originate in the marketing organization, but it needs to obviously have buy-in from the entire organization. And we all need to be able to inhabit and participate in that story. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody, you know, reading from the same sheet of music. Um, and then in some cases, I think post sales, especially on the consumer side, or when the price is low, anybody in the post sales part of the business probably isn't communicating orally, verbally, they're, they're probably writing it down. And so you get back into this, yep. you know, can you communicate um, and continue sell. I, I believe you have to be able to continue marketing your offering after that transaction because now you're saying you bought it, but you can cancel at any time. Right. Here are some reasons and ways you can continue to use it to get the value that you're entitled to, so that you don't cancel. That's right. I mean, that's that's the 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 gist of why we care. You know. So I tried to introduce <laughs> in my naivete. I tried to give marketers another term or another thing to think about, which is you know we're already focused on lead generation and lead nurturing, and we understand if you're in marketing, you understand what those activities are. So I tried to introduce a third one, which is called value nurturing, which is consistently nurturing the experience of value once someone has signed up. And I tried to say this belongs to marketing too. Or not, you can you can cede it to someone else. But you know, the longer your business, a subscription says subscription based business is in business, and the more successful it is, more of your revenues are going to come from your current customers. So, if marketing wants to be relevant, they should be affecting those revenues and not just the net new net new revenues, right? I mean, you 
it, show me the money, be where the, where you have the largest leverage on the income and the revenue of the business. Yeah. And value nurturing. I love that term, which is really about the marketer's role after the point of sale um, to continue to deepen the value um, achieved on both sides. Right. Um, and it doesn't and just belong to marketing. I mean, I think value nurturing then belongs to everybody, everyone who has any interaction, even, you know, fulfillment and, you know, certainly the, the customer success team support. They're all trying to uh, nurture that sense of value to make people think that they've made a good decision and they're achieving value from their decision to renew. Yeah, it's a very it's a very different mindset. And you talk about mindset for marketers um, as being uh, as important as tactics. Well, exactly. Yes. <laughs> why, why why is it so important? And what is the right mindset uh, for a, a subscription marketer or somebody that's involved in, in value nurturing post sale? Sure. Well, so to answer this, I'm going to ask you first to flip and think about as a consumer, the difference between simply buying something, I'm going to go buy a new pen, right? And subscribing to something, I'm going to subscribe to a new pen every month, right? These are, these feel really different to me as a person. I'm, I suspect they do to you. One is just a quick, uh, yeah, is this pen good enough? It'll meet my needs. I'm done. And another is this ongoing relationship. So as marketers, we need to take into account the fact that it's a different kind of decision. And so we need to do more than just say, look at my features. You know, we have to say, this is what it's going to be like to be in this long-term relationship with us. We have to say, this is a relationship. You can trust us. We'll trust you. Uh, it's a different thing. And beyond just saying a one-time exchange of value for money, we are you know, not a transactional or relational uh, thing now. Now we're getting into a relationship and we need to say, okay, this is valuable. It will continue to be valuable. Uh, you can trust us. We'll work together and, and have a relationship. So it's a fundamentally different thing in your subscriber's head. Ergo, you have to think carefully about your marketing tactics and strategies and what you do to support that. You have to think differently about how to sell. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember, you know, very early in my career, I was doing um, marketing at a at a tech company, and I remember we had this um, product guide, a pig product information guide, and it was basically what you gave to somebody when they bought this enterprise solution that told them, you know, here's all the features and here's how they work, and if you put that product information guide side by side with anything else that marketing did it was like night and day because it was so, uh, you know, kind of poorly written, no illustrations. Um, there was no selling in it. There was no, I wanna make sure that the customer is using these awesome features that we spent all this time building. And the reason was, you know, once they drive the Lamborghini off the showroom floor, you know, it's not my problem, yep. right? And today, you know, we see this, how, um, you know, how much more important customer experience is, uh, user experience design is so much more important. Yeah. Um, it's a, it is a different mindset and it does affect not just marketing, but but every part of the organization because the customer can leave. That's why the customer still has choice every day. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And this is, you know, really a different way of thinking about marketing. You're not just chasing the net new sale, although too many people are still just chasing the net new sale, but you shouldn't be, you should be looking at the long-term relationship because you, you know, you, you know, this Robbie, you can lose money chasing and acquiring the wrong customers. Yes. Yeah. You know, net new sale yeah. is not necessarily always the right thing if it's so, not the right customer. Yeah. And, and right now, especially, I think a lot of subscription companies are thinking about this, you know, um, budgets are tight. Uh, and, you know, I can't tell you how many clients have told me in the last month or two hey, it's not enough anymore for me to prove that I could acquire customers or even keep them. I have to prove that they're profitable. Ah, okay. Right? Yep. And so it's about this, you know, customer lifetime value as a, a multiple of, of the cost of acquisition. Um, it's, it's a very different experience. And I think a lot of people, you know, somebody told me this great, um, I don't know if it's true or not, but she said, you know, you have to be, you know, over 40 
to have been had a PL the last time the economy was down. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, sure. So there's a lot of if the average, you know, if people join the workforce, let's say, you know, in the early 20s, um, that means that there's a lot of people out there who have never seen a down economy and have not really had to be so focused on break even profitability, yep. making your little business off in the corner of the large company pay for itself. Or if you're in a startup situation where there's less about, you know, go for the gusto and more about pay your own way. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, yeah. you know, what advice do you have for subscription marketers if they do find these new pressures or, or find that their budgets are, are shrinking and their, their goals are staying the same? Yeah. So uh, we've already touched on one, which is to think carefully about the customers that you are um, that you are attracting, that, that you want to attract. Uh, and, you know, the old adage about how much easier it is to keep a current customer than acquire a new one. Right. I mean, it, it, absolutely invest in these relationships and actually investing in relationships during the difficult times um, gives you a nice base base for growth when things do improve. Um, I think we need to be careful about thinking of, uh, you know, I think there's room for non-budget sensitive activities. When you're talking about relationships, it's not just about, you know, the most advertising spent is, you know, that that has nothing to do with relationships. Uh, relationships can take place in a really delightful email that you get when you order something and it's been shipped and the email that you get from the people makes you laugh and get some perspective into the company. Um, relationships can be fostered when you um, have a shared set of values with your customers, right? When, when you understand your customer story and you say, you know, we really believe in, you know, rescuing dogs. And so all the percentage of our profits go to that. And the customer says, yes, I want to be a customer because that is there. Uh, so sometimes the things that have the biggest impact on your customer relationship are not things that are budget intensive. Um, and it's something to think about creatively all the ways that you can, in fact, nurture that relationship uh, that uh, doesn't have to do necessarily with um, uh, with spending huge marketing budgets, but it does have to do with thinking carefully about your customers who are best served with your solution, your best customers, those who are going to have the most lasting success with you because they'll stick around. So it's, a, you know, it's the harder work of, of showing up in a relationship, right? Rather than just spending right. money, you know? <laughs> right. It's less about, it's less about dating and yeah. <laughs> more exactly. about being committed, right? <laughs> right, right. And maybe that's why we have a hard time with this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you, I mean, so to summarize, um, you said uh, in, in the time of, the, of, of, a, of a budget crunch, number one, get even more focused on who your best customer is, your best yeah. subscriber, um, and, and use your limited ad spend or marketing spend on people that fit that profile. Yeah. Um, second thing that you said is find other ways to nurture the relationship um, yep. even through you know emails um humor whimsy yep. um but really thinking about you know post-sale interactions with existing uh subscribers um and and it sounds like it's you know it's actually good discipline for any business to spend a little time on this stuff like it's not that anybody is wishing to have smaller budgets but it does force you to use some muscles that you haven't been leaning on. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you can just like be checking all the boxes and doing all the things, perhaps you've really been scattering your, you know, your efforts and not getting the most out of your investment. Uh, I mean, I, you know, marketers in particular are prone to the shiny object <laughs> syndrome. It's like, oh, let's fill the whole TikTok thing. You know, I mean, whatever, whatever the thing may be, um, we were suckers for it. Um, and so to make yourself be a little bit more disciplined uh, is is really useful, especially when you do it in service of a lasting relationship with your customer. And another thing I'd suggest is find ways to open, you know, that, that is not a one-way channel to your customer, but you're hearing back and, and working with them. Because when things are tough, you can say, you know, which is going to be more important to you, A or B, and and use use some insight to, um, to have people feel like you were, you know, in this relationship together, as opposed to a unilateral 
decision on things yeah. and keep people posted. You know, if prices have to go up, be honest about what that is. Try to, you know, talk about what maybe what value you might be able to add. Make sure you're looking at how they perceive the value they have of being a subscriber in that situation. Um, you know, have those hard conversations honestly. And yeah, you'll lose people, but you won't lose people on huff. Right. Yeah, there's a, right, right, right. I love that. You can lose people, but you don't want to lose them in a huff. You, you don't, don't want you them, lose yeah. them. Yeah, you lose them in a huff. They won't come back and they won't say anything good. If you lose them because like, oh, I just can't handle this budget, they can come back when they can. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I like that you also point out the the market research element of um, subscriptions. I've, I've heard it called, especially on the um, when there's physical product involved, but revenue generating market research. Okay. All right. Sub subscriptions are a form of revenue generating market research. Oh, that's so some, brilliant. Yeah. Right. Because you can, you do have permission to ask for feedback. You do, in many cases, see the actual behavior. When did they log in? Did they upgrade or downgrade? Yep. Um, all of that. And that actually allows you to invest more thoughtfully in, in the future of the business. Yeah. Yeah. I think if, I, if we can look back a, a few years to the early on in the pandemic, there were subscriptions, you know, for restaurants that that were helping them with reservations and those that pivoted and say, OK, now we're in this together. What do you want to see in an online takeout order system? You know, those who said right. we're in this together. How can we help you through this thing? And and, you know, those are the ones that I think ha did well. Those that said, you know, you could wash your hands and give up or you could say, how can we work together to create something that's going to meet your needs? And it's going to be messy because we're doing this on the fly, but that's okay because you're, you've got some feedback in it. Um, so, I mean, I saw a lot of, we saw, I think in those days, a lot of creative uh, responses to situations that were not planned. Um, and because companies that seemed to do well were those that really treated their customers, not as a resource <laughs> for more money, but as a, as the longer term part of their business and how was it going to grow through that. And I, I think there's lessons to be learned there. Yeah. Too. Yeah. That we're in this together. It is, I mean, the word membership, whether you use it or not, I think reminds, especially companies and, and em employees that these are people who are going to be around for a long time. So we need to treat them as if we're going to see them in the future. And yeah. that back to your point on mindset, that becomes really important and valuable when, when something dramatically changes like what happened in the pandemic. Yeah. 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 And so that's when we talk about mindset, really, that's the fundamental thing is to change from this transactional to this longer term relationship. You know, what if this person was here next to me, how would they feel about what I was doing right here? Um, yeah. So if you were helping to hire people for uh, the marketing organization in a subscription business, assuming that, you know, they have the, the usual credentials, what are you looking for? Um, how do you know if they have the right mindset to, to be effective? So especially in the early stage of a business, I would look for someone who is not afraid to question established practices in the industry, because I think we need to just get out of the way that marketing's always been done and be more creative and look at, no, that's what they do over there in retail. And that's what they do over there and, you know, something else. Um, so, so a, a creativity in that sense of, of, of questioning those practices. Um, but secondly, and maybe even more important, especially as the business goes, is a certain uh, courage of your convictions then to resist the constant pull of the quick short-term win that damages the relationship, to resist yeah. the constant pull of the shiny new thing that takes your ball off of your eye off the ball of what is it, who are you serving and why? Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we need to question assumptions, but don't question principles, right? <laughs> it takes a certain kind of steadfastness and courage. I encourage, I say, because the world is always pulling us to the quick win. That may not be something that serves us well in the long term. Yeah. So. And that's, I think that's especially tempting right now when people, people are scared they're seeing budgets pulled back on their products and saying, how yeah. do we hit our numbers? And as you point out, quarterly capitalism is a very real phenomenon um, of people saying, you know, we got to hit this number for our shareholders or honestly for my bonus, 
I've definitely worked with my share of companies where leadership shot down a very sound subscription argument because they had to hit a number this quarter to get their bonus. Oh, geez. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so, you know, back to your, your earlier points about how hard it was to convince large companies to change their behavior. If, if compensation is based on acquisition, nobody's going to spend, I mean, they'd be stupid to spend time on retention because they're not going to be rewarded for it. Yes. So, so that becomes an important element to understand is what are the, what are the incentives, yeah. um, not just at the level of the team, but at the level of leadership or even the level of the ownership right. of, the, of the company. Right. Which is right. This really, this discussion has to filter all the way to the top. It, you know, it has to, it has to filter up there or else you're just going to be fighting a really hard yeah. battle. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, I always say to people who are looking for jobs and subscriptions, I'm like, make sure that the CEO says that subscription is a top three priority, yeah. but don't go yeah. work there because you'll never be able to move that mountain. Yes. Oh, that's very good. That's great advice, Robbie. So, of yeah. course. Yeah. Right. I mean, I just, I, you know, I think a lot of people come in with a lot of optimism that they can change um, the whole organization and it's hard to do that from the middle. Once again, the relationship, I can change and yeah, the relationship right, analogy right, comes into right. play. They're not going to change. If they didn't do oh. it when they were courting, they're not going to do it now that, you know, things are, are finalized. Yeah. Um, so um, I want to change gears uh, a, a little bit. Um, freemium and free trials, the role of free in subscription businesses is a much discussed topic. Yes. Where do you come down on when, how much organizations should give stuff away? Yeah. Um, and this, this is a delicate dance with that. Are you attracting the right person discussion? Right. So we need to look at that first. Um, uh, and where you are. I mean, if you were totally brand new out of the gate, you just need people to see how the thing works. You needed them to see the experience to understand it. There's a, a reasonable argument to just say, look, you know, try everything for free. I, I think what the, what a freemium does, well, free trial versus, versus, you know, the free and premium level, or, you know, they're two, two different discussions. Um, if there's a, a vi uh, network effect in your software, then the free and premium, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I think the one caution I have with that is to remember, uh, to make sure that if you're going for the free and premium, that your finances are going to work if it scales a lot. Uh, because at that moment when you have to say, you know what, we can't offer this free anymore. We're going to gut this one and go for it. You know, uh, you're taking something away from people and we have this loss aversion and we get really upset when things are taken away from us. So that will be a harder thing to ride through that transition. Um, so if you're offering a free with a premium, make sure the free is not a brain dead version of the premium, but genuinely has some value in itself. And then it's a, you can, you will be able to continue offering it or have to bite the much more painful uh, process of taking something away from it. Um, the, the free trial is always or often a good idea because you know, if a subscription is built on both trust and value, it's an opportunity for you to say, look, we're going to trust you to use it free for a month. You know, we try it out and see what the experience is. So I think the free trial uh, makes a lot of sense, especially for fairly complex um, uh, situations. I mean, I'm just embarking on a free trial of an email program and I'm just, you know, delighted by all the training that's available to me. And, you know, I can call and get support and I get to see what it's going to be like to be a customer. And I think that that's a really, uh, nice thing in my perspective as I up my investment in this software that I feel good about the vendor I'm with. So I would think about that as a, a chance for the subscriber, potential subscriber to experience what it's like to be an actual subscriber. Uh, and so not just how to use the software, but to be in a relationship with the company. Um, so you need to bring your your best game to supporting those free trial users. Yeah, yeah. So you know, that what I hear you say is, you know, number one, um, know that you have an ROI on your free offering so that yeah. it, it will scale with you. Yeah. Um, and look for opportunities to, try it because it can be 
free trial can certainly be valuable as a way of building trust and freemium can be effective as part of a bigger business model but you better know what the part is that it's playing in that bigger business model viral you better network yeah effect. how does the premium play and are the people who absorb take the free one going to be the kinds of people you know what percentage of them have to be premium for it to make sense um and are you going to reach them um obviously it works very well with some some solutions and less well with others that's you know yeah tricky tricky yeah <laughs> <laughs> I didn't yeah, solve I mean, the problem <laughs> right right it's it's I mean I think of it the thing I the thing that I often say to people is consider free but don't always do it right you should always yeah. consider it it should always it is a tool it can be really powerful but make sure that you understand what it's being used for and I think what you point out that's so true is anything that you do in subscription is based on trust and consistency so once you give something away it is very hard to take it back exactly yeah so be yeah careful yeah yeah very sense. hard and you've seen we've seen businesses that have started out this way and then had to okay now we're going to gut this and make everybody move to the free thing and they you know maybe financially works but they do lose a lot of customers at that time and their, their competitors pick up a lot of customers and say, okay, you know, MailChimp right. just raise the rates and come on over and we'll do a free transit. You know, I mean, you're, you're, you're definitely heading for some choppy waters when you do yeah. that. Yeah. It yeah. makes, it makes customers reconsider their decision in the first place. Right. Right. Cause you're throwing it all open again. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. Um, something else controversial, uh, what is your perspective on hiding the cancel button? And, and I know you're going to say it's bad because it is bad, but more and more, especially in this, this time of, you know, difficult budgets and recession and people pulling in, I'm hearing again, this, you know, this murmur of, yeah, it's not the nicest thing in the world to do, but it does work. Yeah. So where where yeah. do you come down on on hiding the cancel button? Adding you know two screens, two clicks to get out, or you know you can you can sign up online, but if you want to cancel, you got to call us on Tuesdays between four and four fifteen. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, you're making you, my skin crawl. Okay, so 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 here's where I sign. Oh, well, first, okay, check the laws because I think there's some laws at least in California about that. So make sure that you're on the right side of the law um, on that. But Here's what I have to say. Yes, short term, this may be more profitable, as you said, short term. Um, and this is what I was talking about, having the courage to resist things. This is one of the issues. Um, if you're basing your business's success on your customers being too distracted or lazy or pressed for time or stupid to unsubscribe, that's a really dangerous long-term game. And I'll, I'll tell you why. It's because we live in an age of radical transparency. <laughs> Eventually, your customers are going to figure it out. They're going to talk to others about it. It's going to work against you. Um, I, I think you have to assume that your customer is sitting right there next to you at your desk saying, oh, really? That's your plan. I mean, would you would you want those meeting notes published to the world? Let's make sure it's really hard to unsubscribe and we'll squeeze an extra two months of subscriptions out of everybody. It's like, yeah. Um, more to the point, you know. So the numbers person says, but you know, it's look, it's making us money. I would say, yeah, but um, do you want if that's what your business is, the decision your business is making that you're going to profit off your customers working against their best interests, right? I want to profit off of them making mistakes. That's what you're saying. Right. I wouldn't want to be involved with that company as a customer, and I wouldn't want to be involved with that company as an employee. Right. Bad um, deal, bad karma. Bad karma. If that's the decision you want to make and you, you know, to help, gee, I hope all your employees feel really engaged with working for you, right? Go for it. But you know what? They might also be able to find a company that's more aligned with their values. You know, I don't know. It's it's bad karma. It, yeah. People will do it.
but more and more people are on to it too. As, co as consumers, we see it, we feel it. It's like, ah, oh, you know, we sign up for these services that help us find and get rid of those hidden subscriptions. I mean, we are, every time you do it, you're kind of poisoning the well for, for uh, businesses that don't, you're, you know, it's not the right thing to do. Yeah. You know, and it will haunt yeah. you in the long term. I, I, I agree. think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So do you have time for a speed round? Uh oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I do. Sure. Okay. Okay. First subscription you ever had. Oh my God. I think it was probably the Ranger Rick magazine when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Loved Ranger I just Rick. dated myself terribly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, favorite subscription as a writer. Oh, wow. Um, favorite subscription as a writer. I have so many. Um, I can't even tell you. I don't even know where to begin. Uh, I'm having a lot of fun right now. It's not my favorite as a writer, but it's fun just for as a brainstorming buddy with, with chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you that. Okay. Oh, that, that's a good one. Um, yeah. Best uh, subscription marketing campaign. Um, and you can have a few. Best subscription. I love the things that don't look at all like marketing campaigns. I love the things like, you know, Fender giving away more online free guitar classes during the pandemic. I love, you know, those kind of generous things. They don't look like marketing campaigns, but they are serving that function of uh, giving value out in the world. So um, I love things like that. Relationship building campaigns yep. that trust in the long term. Yep. Yep. Long term plays. Those are the ones that impress me. Um, what you're reading right now. Um, what am I reading? I'm reading uh, Annie Duke's book, Quit, about when to know when to stop doing something. It's very interesting. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Huh. I enjoy cool. her I'll work to, a lot. Yeah. I'll have to put that on my list. I haven't yeah. read that. Um, this is great. Um, we could we could keep talking for a long time. Uh, Obviously. <laughs> did not get to all the questions that I had, but, um, you know, I, I love talking to you. Thank you so much um, for all that you've done for the world of subscriptions. And thank you for being a, a guest today on, on Subscription Stories. Oh, thanks for having me, Robbie. It's always, always fun to talk with you. We are so aligned. <laughs> <laughs>